Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and bringing you the story behind the story, the news behind the news, hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at and illusion is usually king. But in the battle for survival of Western civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine just what the future will bring. Now, I want to introduce to you uh, Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan. And Dr. Dunnigan is a pediatrician. He, practiced in Pits- uh, he practices in the eastern part of the United States. And uh, he's been practicing in it for 30 years. Uh, but some 28 years ago, he heard a fascinating lecture uh, given by uh, Dr. Day, uh, who had been a professor at uh, the medical school he had attended. And this uh, talk was given to a, a group of young doctors with the proviso that nobody would take notes and nobody would record what was said. Dr. Day then went on to become a director of the Planned Parenthood Federation. So uh, right now, let's um, uh, introduce Dr. Dunnigan. Dr. Dunnigan, it's so good for you to, uh, to be with us or to have you with us today. Oh, my pleasure. All right, fine. Well, why don't you just uh, give our listeners the background of this incredible, incredible story you heard 28 years ago, which is so prophetic as far uh, as what's unfolding today. And let me just, uh, for the listener, uh, comment that one of the things that uh, was said 28 years ago was we would have sex without reproduction and reproduction without sex. And as we begin thinking about the artificial insemination and now the new cloning process, you realize that what was said 28 years ago uh, to a young pediatrician uh, is all coming to pass today, a part of a long-range plan of of a group of men who do have an agenda. So why don't you pick up the story from there? Well, when we sat down to listen to the lecture, uh, we were all expecting something clinical. Uh, Dr. Day, uh, his areas of uh, primary uh, research concern had always been newborn, premature birth, uh, and the problems with uh, uh, carnicterus uh, coming from neonatal jaundice and temperature control in uh, premature babies. So we, we were all expecting something scientific, and uh, as the presentation unfolded, it was uh, quite a surprise uh, because there was nothing scientific. It was all what we might call sociologic. Um, and as you alluded a while ago, uh, Dr. Day had indicated that he wanted to see nobody taking notes or using a tape recorder because the uh, things he was going to talk about, uh, actually he said in the process, if you ever quote me on these things, I will deny them. He seemed to be indicating that uh, there could be some sort of physical danger to him uh, for speaking out about such things. Uh, that was more a suggested, I think, uh, rather than an explicit statement. But, um, you know, when you hear that sort of thing very early in a, uh, what you're anticipating to be a scientific presentation, uh, that really caught my attention. You know, what are you going to be telling us that uh, could put you in some danger one way or another? So, uh, anyway, as the... Uh, presentation unfolded, uh, began by stating that uh, anybody with uh, an eighth grade education could do the arithmetic and determine that uh, the earth would soon be overpopulated if there were no limits put on human reproduction. Um, And Part and parcel of the overpopulation then would be outgrowing our natural resources and over pollution of the planet. These people always refer to the world or the earth as the planet. So um, in the beginning, it seemed as though the presentation was almost an apology for things that we would, in the audience, find unpalatable but there were several times in the presentation where he would say, this is the only way. There's no other way. Um, this is sort of uh, implying that uh, he knew these things would uh, maybe not sound acceptable to many, if not all, in the audience. 
also the uh, thing that he really this whole thing hung on was population control and uh, up until that time uh, I had heard most of us had heard that term population control uh, to me it primarily meant limiting birth uh, by the end of the presentation I realized that population control has a much much broader meaning than uh, just limiting uh, number of births and even who or who may not be allowed to give birth because the presentation covered just every human endeavor uh, education employment industry entertainment sports uh, toys for children clothing a whole bunch of things that maybe we can get into as we go on here as, as time allows but um, mentioning as you did uh, sex without reproduction and reproduction without sex that was a an important part of this uh, also uh, money and banking uh, which was toward the end of his presentation um, the cashless society move from uh, cash to uh, credit cards to a single credit card to a single identifying card and then ultimately uh, at the end uh, because cards can be lost or stolen, uh, some sort of implant under the skin. In those days, silicone implants were uh, under the very first stages of development. Silicone is uh, inert, so the body tends to uh, tolerate it fairly well. Um, and this implant then... Uh, could serve as identification um, and be an element in uh, carrying on commerce, which, uh, as I say, would replace cash, replace checks from a checking account, replace plastic uh, credit cards, which back at that time were starting to really accelerate in use um, so that... Um, all of these items that serve your, your uh, financial and banking needs also would serve for identification, and um, this could be implanted. <laughs> I'm laughing because at the time he said, uh, some of you hearing this will uh, right away think there is a religious connotation here. Um, and at that time, I had no idea what he's referring to. I was not uh, much of a Bible scholar. And then it was only later that I read the book of the Apocalypse uh, about the uh, uh, the mark of the beast on the hand of the forehead. And I made the connection, and I realized why he said what he said. Uh, did he tell you what the relationship was to banking and uh, international finance, or was this just uh, a casual remark about the fact that we would progress to uh, a situation or a society where everybody would be marked and identified? Um, yeah, he went, uh, the presentation was that, um, the changes that he was projecting from then, 1969, the target date to have them all in place was the turn of the century. The year 2000, right. Uh, give or take a few years according to how well it would progress, but that was where they were shooting. And this was uh, worldwide, not just the United States or not just uh, United States, Europe, and, you know, so-called Western civilization. But this was to be uh, global, the entire world. Now, did he tell you who was going to be doing it, or was it just, it's, it's going to happen, and, and there's some group behind this? Uh, it's going to happen. There, he never used a proper noun. He used only one proper noun in the entire presentation. Uh, that it was the Rockefeller Institute. Now, what was the tie of the Rockefeller Institute into this? Now, did he say? Um, that had to do with uh, research and uh, the treatment of cancer. And there was something about they had treatments for cancer, but they didn't want to release them because uh, we had to have people dying off. What was that? Yes, that's uh, just about what it was, that uh, uh, many or most cancers now c could be cured. Now, this is back in 1969. Uh, many or most cancers now are curable, but the uh, the information has been held in 
uh, Rockefeller Institute files because imagine what would happen if people stopped dying of cancer. And, of course, that's exactly what Thomas Malthus wrote about back in 1800. You know, we had to have people dying so we could have new people born. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, fascinating. Uh, okay, well, just, I, I, pardon me for interrupting you, but I just wanted to bring that fact out. So uh, this is 28 years ago. You're hearing the predictions of what the future holds uh, uh -huh. for the world. So why don't you pick it up from there? Well, um... I'm just trying to recall where he started. There was uh, this general overview about controlling birth, uh, who may or may not be allowed to have birth, implying that uh, certain people would be not allowed to have children. Uh, most people would be allowed two. Uh, exceptional people might be allowed three, but uh, never more than that. The replacement statistic that is widely quoted is 2.1 births per couple. The point one meaning, uh, you know, two, two would replace the two parents, and then the point one is because of some untimely deaths of disease or accident or whatever, so replacement levels felt to be just a little above two. Um, in that context too he mentioned that um, something we feel that we can accelerate and control evolution and this was in a context of uh, controlling who might be allowed to uh, reproduce in other words if your genes were acceptable uh, you would be allowed to bear children but if they were not uh, you might be forbidden to bear children um, that's when the, the business about sex without babies and babies without sex uh, got some development uh, in that uh, certain people who had desirable genetic characteristics that should be perpetuated for the good of the world uh, could be, would be encouraged to reproduce but they need not reproduce in the in the natural way through sexual intercourse, but uh, this could be all done in the laboratory. Um, then along those lines, uh, the question which he anticipated, by the way, I should say we, there was no opportunity for any of us in the audience to uh, ask any questions, but um, because the uh, sexual instincts are so strong, he said you might think that uh, at first we would try to uh, de-emphasize sex, but uh, that's nearly impossible to do because the uh, feelings are so strong. So the plan is to go the other way, to uh, encourage sexual activity, uh, uh, promote sexual desire, but do it in such a way that it's directed away from uh, reproduction. And um, part and parcel of that then was uh, the promotion of uh, uh, contraceptive devices. Uh, they would be promoted in such a way that it would be just instinctive and natural that when you were thinking about sex, you would automatically connect it to uh, contraception, that uh, sex without contraception would be uh, sort of a deliberate mental process, but most sexual activity would uh, be linked to contraception. Now, how do you do that? Well, um, sex education in the schools. And was, was he talking about sex education and its importance back there in 1969? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he developed that uh, to some extent, uh, that this would be taught in the schools, uh, kids would be taught to uh, see the uh, the birth control pill was it was 69 um, the birth control pill came in about it, it was around in the early 60s wasn't it mid 60s yeah early to middle 60s right and uh, so that, this was all fairly uh, fairly new stuff and it, of course he talked about things that had been around a while too condoms and diaphragms 
but that this would be taught in the schools, the use of these. I remember that uh, particularly because as he was saying this, I was recalling some of my teachers from high school uh, and say, oh, I can remember Miss so-and-so, but, <laughs> you know, she would never, never uh, feel that she could talk about these things. Of course, th- I was thinking of one of my algebra teachers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was talking about uh, something entirely different. But, you know, that was a connection I made in my mind that uh, in my high school this uh, never would have gone off the ground. Now, you were t- uh, frantically taking notes all during this uh, uh, lecture on napkins that you had, uh, and uh, so that uh, nobody would really realize you were taking notes because you'd been asked not to, but you sensed that this was important, so you were recording this for posterity at the time. Yes. Uh, many of the things that he said I had heard before from... Uh, other sources, primarily one source, which I considered to be unreliable. And uh, I'd heard it at length uh, with some repetition to the point where actually it became annoying to me. And um, I dismissed it because I considered the source uh, not reliable. And here, then it was a few years later, see, the the first I'd heard it was uh, from this viewpoint. I stand out here seeing over there that there's a conspiracy going on. Uh, It's very broad-based, it's very pervasive, it's very subtle, nobody knows it. And only uh, a few of us who are able to see this know what's going on. Well, I I dismissed that. Well, then here in 1969, I heard from the other end, uh, I'm part of it. I know what's going on. I've been told what's going on. I've been privy to... Uh, certain privileged information, and here it is. <laughs> so, you know, hearing all this stuff from a different perspective, I'm not an outsider looking in, I'm an insider speaking out the window to you. Uh, believe me, that had quite an impact. So that um, most of the things he said I, I had heard before, And then as the talk unfolded, and uh, quite frankly was offensive in many ways to me, um, it wasn't things that I was hearing for the first time, but rather confirming some things that I had heard before. Like the relocation of industries, uh, breaking down our armed forces, um, shipping our jobs overseas so that uh, unemployment would go up. Uh, Those were some that that I'd heard before and would not believe. Uh, but, uh, of course, one of the things he talked about was how we were going to encourage people to buy foreign products because uh, we were intentionally going to produce shabby cars in America so that people would buy Japanese. And of course, in 1969, that, most people would have thought that was crazy talk. But what did he say along that line uh, with the idea that this would then justify the shifting of American industries to foreign countries? Yeah, this was to establish the global economy. The idea be we would have one global worldwide commercial system. Um, it wasn't his term originally, but he alluded to what they call uh, the Declaration of Interdependence. I think it was Buckminster Fuller who wrote that. It's sort of a parody or takeoff on a Jefferson's Declaration of Independence for our country. And uh, it's been a while since I've read that, but the opening sentences of the Declaration of Interdependence are an echo of uh, our Declaration of Independence. And the idea is that uh, every part of the world should be uh, involved in a single economy with different parts of the world having emphasis on different aspects of a global economy. And the United States was to be the information center. Our smokestack industries were to be uh, sent to other countries. Um, Then did he explain how that would come about? Just that the the people who make the decisions, the uh, captains of industry and uh, politicians would get together and decide uh, we'll close a steel mill here and reopen it there. Um, 
Now, what was this about building in obsolescence to American cars uh, so that they'd break down and people would become disillusioned uh, with our vehicles and buy Japanese? Yes, the idea was to promote uh, specifically the Japanese auto industry. Uh, this was a principle that was applied other ways, but they they wanted to um, build up the hard industries in Japan and not eliminate ours, but de-emphasize them. So that uh, the way to do this was uh, if you bought uh, an American-built car and the door handle kept coming off or the window <laughs> crank would fall off or some piece under the hood that uh, should have been made of metal was made of plastic and it would crack and uh, you would become irritated by that and then your neighbor who had a Japanese car would say well I've driven this for so many years and so many uh, thousands of miles and all I do is change the oil on the tires well, and did Dr. Day actually talk about this? Well, yeah, he said th this was in the plans. Th this was the long-range plan uh, as of 28 years ago yeah. uh, to begin uh, orienting Americans towards buying foreign products by intentionally creating inferior products in America. I know my wife was saying the other day that she doesn't hate to buy anything uh, clothing made in America because it just falls apart, you know. Uh, the, the threads come out, the buttons pop off, and, uh, you know, of course, you, she attributed this just to, uh, you know, accidental shoddy workmanship, but... Uh, uh, you're suggesting that maybe there is a, uh, a plan, uh, at least as far as certain of our products, uh, to discourage Americans from buying them uh, to actually uh, buy them overseas, thus transferring America's wealth, industry, uh, and production to other nations as we uh, then lose jobs here in America? Right, right. I remember this particularly because, as a matter of fact, I probably was laughing to myself, as I do now when I recall it. Uh, thinking this, they could never get away with this. Well, I was a child during World War II, and I remember that uh, we always laughed at things that were stamped made in Japan. Right, I remember that too. Uh, and we were very proud that American-made goods were uh, more reliable and more enduring. And so this was a complete about-face. That which was made in Japan now was going to be the superior product, and ours the inferior product. And uh, part of the idea behind this was a psychological preparation that uh, the, there's sort of a, should we say, patriotism. You know, things that are made in my hometown are the best. Things that are made in my state are the best. Things that are made in America are the best because we're the best country in the world. And they were trying to destroy that belief? Yes, yes. So that you would say, well, uh, I might be a patriotic American, but, uh, gee, I can't afford to be buying second-rate stuff when I can save money buying a foreign import. So patriotism would take a back seat to uh, economy, you know, to my personal economy. And this then would break down the kind of uh, loyalty to your locale or to your nation and foster a uh, more cosmopolitan citizen of the world attitude. Destroy the love of country. Uh-huh. Okay, fine. I think that's such a fascinating insight into the mentality uh, of these people who uh, seem to uh, have such tremendous power uh, for education, over industry, or even over our uh, ways of reproduction today. Well, what other sorts of things did they talk about? I remember one thing that you mentioned was how they were going to encourage uh, sexuality and uh, they were going to try to get people's minds oriented onto sexuality. Did they talk at all about homosexuality and, and how that would be used? Yeah, um, that would be promoted, uh, not just merely tolerated or, or permitted, but actually to be promoted. The idea uh, being that no child ever results from a homosexual union. Um, the business of uh, morality, especially a religious-based morality, uh, really would have no part in, uh, in this future. <laughs> Which is the present now? Uh, <laughs> it's it's almost uh, you'd laugh because it's so ridiculous what has transpired, and uh, you either laugh or you cry. 
Well, you know, it, between then and now, it's been uh, quite an experience to watch this unfold right according to the script. Right. Uh, the unfolding nightmare is uh, the moral foundations of our once great uh, Christian society are, are progressively undermined. Consider this. If um, we're going to have babies without sex and sex without babies, then for a large part, we interchange the section, sexes. Uh, there's no real difference between men and women. Uh, did, he, did he stress that, uh, how we were going to feminize men and masculinize women? Uh, he more stressed masculinizing the women than he did feminizing the men. And uh, this would start in youth. For example, one of the things he mentioned was uh, that toys that were available for children would be changed. Uh, girls would get footballs and soccer balls. And uh, baby dolls and tea sets, uh, you know, little domestic kits like a dustpan and broom, uh, some of that would disappear entirely, and other things like that would be uh, very, very greatly de-emphasized. <clears throat> In other words, trying to undermine the maternal or uh, these rather normal I instincts that women have for uh, being housekeepers uh, to get them more out into the uh, labor market and... Uh, Yes, yes, exactly. And certainly if they're out in the labor market, they're not going to be having children. That's right. Uh, if mom's at home and she's enjoying her first and second baby, she's likely to say, well, it's time for a third and fourth. Right. And I can take care of these kids uh, because my hubby's uh, making a reasonable living and uh, we can support them. And, of course, now you can't. You have to have the woman working uh, because of the tax system and because of uh, the actual, not in dollar amount, but in purchasing amount, decrease in the wages uh, of the average American working male. Yes, yes. Yeah, the term they use is discretionary spending. And your discretionary spending, of course, you lose all discretion because the tax collector <laughs> takes it. And so you're, uh, you're just trying to survive. And then... Um, if mom has one or two children that she worries about while she's at work, uh, that's enough worry for her. So she's not going to say, well, I'm going to keep my full-time career and have more children. You know, that uh, just gets too much to, to be uh, concerned about. Take, worrying about daycare, getting somebody to take care of the children. And so what we're really talking about is an organized plan of social engineering laid out many, many decades ago uh, that is coming to fruition uh, really in the, in the intervening decades. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, one other thing you, uh, I wanted to develop a little bit, and then we could go on, and that's the, about the promoting of sexual activity. Okay. Um, in 1969, abortion was a crime in every one of the states. And uh, at that time, he said, well, it won't be long until abortion not only is no longer a crime, but will be seen as uh, a right and uh, be tax-supported, uh, which at that time sounded incredible. By promoting sexual activity among youngsters and linking it strongly to contraception, um, Planners realized that uh, more pregnancies would occur. The um, idea then was, that's okay. If there are more pregnancies that occur, we'll have an abortion backup. And people who would otherwise oppose abortion will change their mind when they say, well, this is my daughter who's pregnant at a young and tender age. And abortion restrictions might be okay for everybody else. So you were saying how they were going to change our attitude towards abortion, and how uh, in uh, pardon me, in 1969, uh, abortion was illegal uh, in every state. So what did they plan? How were they going to change that? Well, the idea is to promote early sexual activity among the kids. Um, connecting it strongly with the use of contraceptives. They would be taught that the two just naturally should go together. And then with the realization that with more sexual activity, there would be more pregnancies, more contraceptive failures, one might say. Um, 
but no need to worry about cluttering up the planet with unwanted babies because abortion then would be available uh, as a backup. And with young girls uh, getting pregnant uh, too early in their life, people who otherwise would uh, maybe object to abortion when, you know, if it was in somebody else's life, would say, yeah, but uh, I no longer object because this is my daughter and uh, I don't want her to have to carry this pregnancy to term because she's not yet mature enough to, uh, to be a mother and take care of a baby. So it, it was sort of a win-win situation for them. Um, it would break down uh, resistance to abortion as well as reinforcing continually the, uh, the need for contraception or <laughs> sex without babies. Uh, you know, uh, as you talk about this, it sounds so diabolical, almost like the plan had come right out of the pit of hell. Yes. <laughs> I think so. I well, think so. And so looking back on this, as you've seen it unfolding over the last 29 years or 28 years, it must have been terribly, terribly frustrating for you uh, uh, seeing these things and uh, knowing what was going on and yet realizing that the vast majority of the American people uh, had no idea at all what was transpiring. It was frustrating, and even talking with some of my colleagues who heard the same presentation, and not very long afterwards, they had all seemed to forget it. Uh, they'd say, oh, yeah, I remember he was here, and I remember he talked about some stuff. But as far as details and saying, well, don't you remember when he said this, that, and the other? Um, uh, they'd say, no, did he say that? Well, I don't know. Like, uh, when I say that, what comes to mind is... Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Day had spoken about the demise pill. Um, the demise pill, there, there was consideration to be given to an arbitrary age after which you know everybody should just pass on. Uh, the age could be set by law, 75, 80, 85, whatever uh, seemed to be appropriate at the time, and then when you reach that age, uh, he would be a candidate to take the demise bill. And he said this uh, attitudes about death needed to be changed and made more, quote, realistic. So, uh, you know, we're all headed for death one way or another, so why not do this in a very cerebral, scientific kind of way? Uh, so the, uh, the idea was that uh, when you had reached the legal age, you could have this nice banquet, sort of a farewell banquet with your family and friends, and afterwards uh, go off and take your demise pill and sleep away peacefully. <laughs> One of my colleagues, who uh, we were uh, outside a meeting in the hospital, and there was some talk about, uh, he was having some pain, he was coming into the hospital uh, to get some tests and maybe have some surgery. <laughs> I said, well, hey, Fred, what are you going to do at night? You know, the night before the operation, maybe you're a little restless and you can't sleep. And the nurse comes in and says, well, here's your sleeping pill. <laughs> are you going to take it? <laughs> if you take it, maybe they won't have to do the operation. <laughs> he just laughed. And he, uh, he said, uh, did he say that? I didn't remember that. And I said, yeah, you better remember he said it. And so they were, even back in 1969, they were talking about a more or less coerced or forced uh, euthanasia. Uh, yeah. uh, did they talk at all about uh, other countries, how they were going to control population uh, in other countries, or uh, poss the possibility of fomenting disease to control uh, a population? Yes. Um. There, there were there were a couple of things there. One, uh, there was a part of the presentation where he said new diseases will appear. Um, they will be very difficult to diagnose. Uh, doctors seeing these for the first time, of course, will not know what's going on. Uh, and the reason I remember this so strongly was I was fairly new in practice. And after hearing him talk about new diseases that would appear, 
I'd have a youngster in the office and be examining him, and I'd, you know, I'd say, gee, he's got this fever and these symptoms, and it just doesn't add up. I wasn't, you know, absolutely certain what was going on. Well, right away, my memory would ring a bell and say, could this be one of those new diseases he was talking about? Well, as it turned out, that that was not the case in, in my practice or with any of my kids. But in, uh, in retrospect, I think he was talking about AIDS. Um, there were some other things that were said that sort of lead me to that conclusion. Uh, what other things were there? Because, of course, my major interest has been the AIDS epidemic. I've been battling this for over oh. a decade. So uh, what, are, what other things were there that, uh, if you can recall, and I know this is a long time ago, yeah. but I just thank the Lord that you took those notes and uh, on, the, on the napkins and then uh, re-recorded them. What other things did he say uh, that made, uh, makes you think that perhaps the AIDS epidemic has something to do with a, with a plan? The continent of Africa is a very rich continent. Now, that's what he said. Well, I'm sort of paraphrasing. Okay, fine, right. And I don't recall that this was in immediate juxtaposition to AIDS, um, but it was pretty close. Okay, so, of course, the, the AIDS epidemic is simply uh, decimating, depopulating Africa. The American people don't know that, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it's really happening today. And so is he talking about possible disease, Africa, or just the fact that it was uh, such a rich, rich continent? Well, here we have a world that's soon to be overpopulated, soon to run out of natural resources, and here's this great big continent of Africa full of resources. Now, this continent should not be left to people who have never been able to develop it. Um, the continent should be under the control of people who know how to develop and manage all these resources. Um, and in effect, what, what that means is uh, you have to get rid of the people that are there now, not totally perhaps, but uh, in large part, to make room for the managers to move in. Uh, that's a frightening, frightening thing to contemplate, and yet that's exactly what is happening in Africa today. Mm-hmm. And the, the interesting thing is that uh, it's always veiled under concern and love, and we're helping you out. Um, uh, you know, we love all our fellow men. But there were some comments about, let's face it, not all people are equal. We all know that. Some people are... Uh, uh, not as smart, not as uh, capable, and uh, capable of doing only menial tasks. And there were some uh, racial allusions there. Now, if you have a continent full of people that uh, are not capable of doing what Europeans are capable of doing, or Europeans who have become Americans are capable of doing, then you can't leave such a large, rich continent uh, under the control of people that can't manage it. The ultimate in racism hiding behind the, the banner of love and compassion. Mm-hmm. Yes. <sighs> yes. Okay, fine. So basically he was talking about, the, do, do he say these diseases would be produced? Where would they come from, uh, uh, these new diseases that were uh, going to come into society? That was not explicit at the time, as, as I recall it. I just... The, the best I can recall was that they would occur, but I kept wondering, am I going to miss them? Will, will I ever recognize them? Or even will I get them? Right. You know, would I myself succumb to, to something like this? Um, but in terms of how this would be brought about, I don't think that was addressed at all. Okay, so uh, we, we begin to see, though, uh, an active program, that not just sort of passively bringing about population control, but actively bringing about population control. Yeah. Uh, were there any other points that he made as far as population control is concerned? That, you know, because these ideas are so foreign to uh, the average 
listener uh, the idea that we would have a, a demise pill. In other words, we would kill older people, and uh, we would, in uh, uh, 1969, the idea that we would start aborting uh, the children of this country in mass numbers was, was so foreign. Uh, did he talk at all about uh, pushing abortion towards certain racial or ethnic groups? That sort of grew out of um, talking about promoting drug use. Uh, well, let's get into talking about promoting drug use because that is so important, uh, especially today when we see uh, drugs destroying the inner cities of America. Um, not everybody deserves space on the planet. Not everybody deserves the right to marry and reproduce. Um, so certain people have to be sort of shunted. Now, I don't mean individual selection where you identify a particular human being, but certain populations with certain group characteristics have to be shunted. Uh, now, part of this grows out of uh, transferring industry overseas. Uh, if uh, I, I thought in terms of our steel industry where a lot of wage earners you know, didn't have to have a lot of education, a lot of savvy to uh, do the work and earn a wage and raise a family. But when these industries are either closed or transferred, then the, uh, the wage earners uh, don't have any other, any place to go to earn money to uh, raise a family. Um, women... This was an education. I, I, heard, I learned a whole lot there. He said, women are attracted to men who are good providers. See, when I was a kid, they, I thought they were attracted to Clark Gable and the <laughs> good-looking movie star. And so this was a really revelation at my age uh, at that time. Here, this women are attracted to men who are good providers. They don't much care what a man looks like. Whereas uh, men are more attracted to a woman by her appearance. And also, a man identifies himself by his work. Uh, and as I thought about what he said, uh, many times in the following years, I think that's absolutely correct. I'm Joe Blow. Uh, I'm a welder. I'm John Jones. I'm a stockbroker. You know, I, I think it's true. We do uh, tend to identify ourselves that way. Well, if you have no job by which to identify yourself, you're not a good provider to attract a woman to become your wife, then you're not going to have as great an opportunity to bear children. Now, if you have a whole bunch of young men who are unemployed, are not good providers, uh, have no strong identity through their work, um, you know, what do these guys do when they get together? Well, there's a certain uh, homosexual promotion there and a certain, uh, you know, falling into crime. Sure. Which uh, I, I think is a natural consequence in which was recognized. Well, now, by, were you talking about crime or were you talking about drug use? Uh, well, where does drug use put into the, come into this whole situation? Okay. Now, if, if you're young and, and you have no job and you have no family, no responsibilities, and life is just a bore then you're more vulnerable to abusing drugs. Now, did he suggest that they would encourage drug use? Yeah, yes. Um, that is an incredible, incredible uh, uh, prediction uh, of what uh, the direction that these people that Dr. Day represented would be taking our society, because they had to have powerful uh, control or powerful influence over uh, uh, governmental uh, uh, positions and governmental activities. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea was to create sort of neighborhoods, uh, doesn't seem like the right word anymore, but certain areas of the cities that uh, would be the jungle. Um, we have progressed so far that the laws of natural selection no longer operate. This is sort of a near quote, paraphrasing. Uh, there was natural population control 
in previous years, predatory animals and wars and disease and such. But now that technology has uh, nullified a lot of that, uh, this is part of the problem of overpopulation. So since the former law of the jungle no longer applies, we would now have a new law of the jungle, and the jungle would be uh, certain areas in primarily large metropolitan areas where uh, people just have no opportunity, no hope. Um, the areas would be allowed to deteriorate um, with the idea that uh, as despair grew and uh, people sought refuge in drugs and alcohol, then a certain amount of violence would be predictable. And that's okay because that would, you know, if you die in 1969 because uh, somebody shot you, or if you died in uh, 1769 because a bear got you, a mountain lion got you, uh, what's the difference? You're dead in either case. You, you succumb to the law of the jungle. The survival of the fittest, on the other hand, means that uh, in a time when you had to be a crack shot with your musket and you got the mountain lion, uh, the only difference is that now instead of being a musketeer, now you're a computer genius. Those are the criteria by which uh, you select to survive. And now, of course, when Dr. Dave was making all of these predictions and telling you what the future held, uh, didn't he make some uh, reference to the fact that everything was in place, uh, that nothing would stop this at the present time, uh, and so he felt at least somewhat um, able to, to reveal these things to you? Yes. Yes, that was uh, fairly early in the presentation that that was said. Um, that was 69, and um, as best I can recall, there there was no nothing specified as exactly what was in place now that hadn't been. But he said something uh, that even as recently as five or ten years earlier, he could not have spoken with such assurance about what the future held. And, of course, uh, he went on then to become some sort of an official with Planned Parenthood? He was, at the time when he spoke, he, uh, he was medical director of uh, Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And he had been a professor at the Year Medical School. Uh, he was a very well-known uh, neonatologist. Yes. Yes, and then uh, he left here and uh, went to Planned Parenthood Federation in New York, uh, became disillusioned there, and I'm not sure the nature of that disillusionment, whether it was uh, ideological or what, but uh, um, he did become disillusioned with them and left. Uh, and he's, he has subsequently died? He's passed away? Yes, yes. He died uh, mm, eight or roughly eight years ago. I'd, I'd have to look and see uh, my file. So he never saw his dream come to fruition, but uh, uh, certainly the people who are in, uh, in sympathy with these ideas are seeing it unfold today as America moves into chaos and crime and drugs and uh, new diseases uh, developing uh, all across America. Uh, so uh, basically, as you look back on this, uh, what do you think possibly motivated uh, Dr. Day to, to tell you these incredible things? Everybody asks <laughs> that question, and uh, I can only speculate. I, I really don't know. There was not an opportunity to ask. But I, I think there were a couple of things that were involved. One was that I think he had divided feelings about this. Uh, on the one hand, uh, repeatedly saying this is the only way, there's no other alternative, feeling that uh, somehow or another the human race would perish otherwise and that the human race should be promoted to go on. Uh, well, this this uh, is a very common position taken by elitists. Uh, uh, Professor Quigley, who we uh, have studied very extensively, Bill Clinton's mentor, uh, really believed that we needed a ruling elite, else Western civilization would be destroyed. Uh, and what you're really describing is a ruling elite with a program to try to uh, preserve uh, at least some element of civilization? Yes. Yes, I think that's the uh, the upfront part of it. And then 
in the intervening years, it has often occurred to me that what also seems to underline this uh, is a more long-range look. Um, you know, they talk about progress of the human race. Uh, we're progressing. And one should stop and say, well, progressing toward what? Right. And especially when you hear somebody say, we believe now that we have the means to accelerate and control evolution, evolution toward what? Well, I think one possibility, I, I don't know that I've heard anybody state this explicitly, is that uh, we will progress toward becoming gods. <laughs> now, uh, that sounds a little bizarre, but uh, when you go back to read Genesis, and they, uh, Adam and Eve took from the tree of knowledge, and the serpent said, ye shall be as gods. In other words, what you're suggesting is what energizes these people is a spiritual force. Uh, the idea that the serpent's message that ye shall be as gods, if, if you go along uh, with my program. Mm -hmm. You can evolve to a higher plane. And as incredible as it may seem, I, I read many, many publications by people, uh, these are occultic and Luciferian publications, uh, where this is the basic underlying theme, uh, where mankind will supplant God and bring utopia to the world. Well, uh, While I'm thinking about the book of Genesis, when, when you go to the end of that chapter, uh, and when God expelled Adam and Eve, and he said they, they got to the tree of knowledge, a uh, verse or two later, he sets a cherubim in guard of the tree of life. <laughs> and uh, I think about that, you know, we get all this uh, sperm banks and uh, uh, cloning of animals and talking about uh, cross species uh, uh, fertilization. I, I often think about, uh, you know, babies without sex and sex without babies. And early in the big, very early in the game, God set up a chair. He said, they go to the tree of knowledge. I'm going to keep them away from the tree of life. Just for fun, go to Genesis and read that and, and see whether you find any application to what's uh, going on today. Well, I, I think that this this is all prophetic. I mean, we see these things unfolding, and, and for people who don't under, know the Lord or uh, know the Bible, uh, these things seem impossible. Uh, for those of us, and I, I know you're a believer, uh, who see these things unfolding, we see uh, God's hand, and we also see the, the hand of, the, uh, of Lucifer in, in this whole incredible story. Well, are there any other points you'd like to bring out for our listeners? Well, we were talking earlier about... Um uh, unisex stuff, or at least I think we alluded to it, uh, um, the masculinization of women, girls. And uh, I don't know whether you've noticed in your area, but in our area, uh, in the last few years, the sports pages are full of girls' sports. Now, uh, girls' basketball, you know, and uh, as if... You know, Is that true out your way? Oh, yeah, sure. And we have uh, girls' basketball teams here. They're, uh, you know, uh, Olympic uh, girls' basketball teams, girls' volleyball teams, all of these things, uh, you know, where they're so competitive with men. Mm-hmm. Is soccer a big thing out there? Uh, no, we don't have soccer out here, to my knowledge. That'll probably become... <laughs> uh, Women's soccer you're speaking of. Well, no... Women's and men. Uh, okay, by okay. <laughs> Probably someday co-educational soccer. Right. I don't know, but uh, the reason for this is that uh, we can't have girls in lacy dresses smelling perfumey and attracting the men. You mean if they're sweaty, they're not going to be as attractive? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Did did he actually talk about things of this sort? Oh yeah, that that was uh, very explicit. Uh, uh, girls would uh, would be made less attractive because they would be just as you said sweaty right full of uh, you know sports and just like another guy right big uh, muscles and uh, all those things uh, so that was the one of the early parts of uh, masculinizing women and then of course another part that I don't think he put in these terms but I interpret in these terms then is uh, 
a woman is a good woman to the extent that she uh, mimics a man, and that is leaving her home and you know going out into the workforce and becoming CEO or office manager, some big outfit, rather than staying home taking care of children. Um, but along with with the uh, de-feminizing of girls in the professional magazines that I get where drug products are advertised there's uh, one that shows all these girls in their soccer uniforms uh, mud all over them their hair's all wet and stringy <laughs> and this is held out to the young girls as you know this is what you ought to be this is what a, uh, a young girl is she's a muddy soccer player right of course uh, you know we can do anything the boys can do and we can do it better and the competition between women and men <clears throat> without realizing that we all have a place and a part to play in, in God's plan mm-hmm mm-hmm well, I, I, Dr. Dennigan, it's been a, a fascinating, fascinating hour, and we'll be playing this this afternoon and several times uh, on our various radio programs. I want to thank you so very, very much for taking time from your, your busy schedule to uh, be here on Radio Liberty, because I think uh, your message, uh, going along with many of the other messages that we have, uh, begins to tie this together, uh, and I hope our listeners will be uh, far wiser from having uh, heard uh, your memories from uh, the lecture by Dr. Day, 1969, 28 years ago. Well, it's been a, a pleasure to be on, and uh, I, I hope it's helpful to folks. I hope it will be to me. God bless you, and I hope maybe at some time in the future we can ca talk to you again. Well, I would like that. Bye-bye. Th thanks so much. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye. Okay, well, this is Dr. Stan, an amazing, amazing take, tape uh, with a gentleman who uh, I believe uh, God uh, has preserved him to tell us the story. And I hope that you've enjoyed this program as much as we've enjoyed bringing it to you. And so until next time, Dr. Stan, goodbye, and may the Lord be with you. Thank you.